Welcome to Shrimp Cover Look, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I am Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here. We're we're just here. We're here. Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Adrian reads Harry Potter, everybody's favorite segment of the week. Chapters 15 and 16. And how did I get to this point in life? I'm not sure, but you made it through six years of Harry Potter, so like we're, we're getting there. So this is chapter 15, it chapter 16. It feels like six years. It feels like six years. Does it? Well, it's three, only been three, books, yeah. so like it, you're getting there. Yeah, we're, we're doing it. it by semester, basically. <laughs> Every semester of Harry Potter. I, I, You're living the dream. I hate you. So we have chapters 15, The Unbreakable Vow, and 16, A Very Frosty Christmas. Might go over those a little bit here in case people aren't reading along with us, which they should be. Uh, chapter 15, Harry is warned by Hermione about love potions. Uh, love potion number nine. I fear you're going to be excited about that. Uh, so he invites Luna to Slughorn's party. Luna potion number nine. Uh, we find out Snape is in cahoots. Snape cahoot number nine. That's going to get old in a hurry. Uh, with Draco in order to protect him. And Draco has been receiving personal lessons from Bellatrix. Draco is Rocky number three. I love Was Rocky. it three? Is it three? It might be three. I think it's three. We're going to talk about the new Creed movie, but we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. uh, chapter 16, a very frosty Christmas. We get Christmas at the Weasleys. Uh, Harry attempts to discuss Snape and Draco. He also tries to figure out who the Half-Blood Prince is. Uh, and the Minister of Magic shows up and basically attempts to vet Harry to uh, make him look good. Got to get the celebrity endorsement there. So, uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I'm not... Yeah. Not feeling that one? I'm not sure... I'm not sure what Harry's on about with okay. that. Let's start there. Uh, so, Minister of Magic, good old Rufus, shows up at the Weasley house and basically pulls Harry outside and sits him down and basically says, Hey, you know, why don't you uh, stop by the ministry office every now and then? Be good, you know, people seeing the chosen one walking in and out of the ministry... A little good PR for you, a little good PR for me. Maybe we could uh, slip in a job there. Here you want to be an or You're going to be needing to come to this office eventually anyway. Might as well uh, start now. A little yeah. bit of an internship. So what? Do, what is the holdup there? That he doesn't agree 100% with Dumbledore? That Scrimgore does not kowtow to Dumbledore? Basically it comes down to that Harry doesn't agree with what the minister is doing. Uh, they have imprisoned someone, and his name has eluded me at this point, and I apologize for that. Uh, they have imprisoned someone. Stan something. Stan. This is what they call him. Turn Stan. Piker. Stan. Uh, but because of that, Harry doesn't agree with what the minister is doing, uh, because Dumbledore doesn't like what the minister is doing. Therefore, Harry says, absolutely not. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to work for you. I'm not going to better my career. By just showing up every now and then and walking around the government office. That sounds terrible. Right, but it's like Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. This is true. And Harry showing up seems to be one of those things that would help things keep going. It right? Would. So it's one thing to say, oh, I don't agree 100% with Scrimgore and neither does Diddledore. But the problem with that is the weasel father works for Scrimgore, doesn't he? He does. So would or would it not, morale is a real thing. It is. It absolutely you, is. You've worked places where morale was low, right? Absolutely. Have you worked in those same places when morale was higher? Yeah. It's a much it's different much place, better isn't when it? It's when it's high. So um, who, who are we hurting? We're hurting the good magicians here, right? Okay. Uh, it, it seems like here, this is, you know, uh, J.K. Rowling's rallying. Her way of, like, making Harry, you know, a little bit edgy. You know, he's sticking out, sticking on his guns. He's going to stick with Dumbledore through fire and flame. Yeah, but the problem... Is it Rowling or Rowling? J.K. Rowling. Okay, so the problem Rowling. with what Rowling is doing here is that it's obstinance for the sake of obstinance. Okay. Is it, I mean, if, if it's not, tell me. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% willing to be talked down from these points. Well, I think it is kind of a strange thing here because, I mean, if we look at the benefits that are, uh, the benefits for Harry just to do this, it would be in his own best interest. Hey, let's look at our, look it our would, situation. It would be in his own best interest. It would be in the best interest of the Ministry of Magic because if you've got the chosen one showing up every once in a while, you get a little perk in your coffee every morning. Yeah. It would be in the best interest, it would be in the anti-interest of Moldy Voldy, would it not? Because then he thinks... Oh well, this kid's this kid's everywhere, and he's the one that beat me, right? Okay. So I I don't see who this would be working for. 
It seems to be a move that's only working against people. It's situationally here. Let's look at it, uh, United States politics. Uh, the president invites Adrian Fort, and why don't you swing out to the White House? Be good for you, you know. Check it out. We've got this, you know, uh, giving out some awards here. Got some great authors here. Meet a couple people. Just swing out, you know. Be good for you. Good for me. Uh, just you know, give it a shot. Even if you don't agree with the politics, you right. don't piss on that opportunity. Well, and so I, I think that what might be even then. I mean, so you see this. In today's world, Donald Trump is president. The Super Bowl winning Patriots are invited to the White House. A couple of people say, no, F you. Yeah. Right? It's different, though, because all that is when the Patriots go to the White House is a chance to meet Donald Trump. Yeah. And right? It, it's done in more of protest because it's publicly known that this is a thing. Right. This is basically him saying, you know, why don't you just come on out? You know, get the feel of things out here. People see you around. We know you want to work for the Orr's office. Maybe Check you'll learn out. things from the... You know you'll what I'm learn saying? learn a couple things. I don't see the downfall to this, honestly. To, um, to, to what? For Harry. I don't see okay, the downfall. Okay, if he accepted. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's nothing he's losing from this. Um, we've talked a little bit about Rufus Scrimgore, the new Minister of Magic, and he's more of like a war minister, if you would. Uh, he's mentioned he kind of has a lion look about him. He's quiet, very Winston Churchill-esque. Is that him? So I went back and looked. Is that him on the chapter? Is that supposed to be him or is that the old one? Uh, that's just the painting in the office. Oh, okay. Because yes. that looks a little bit like Christopher Hitchens. Fair enough. Um, so I mean, this is the war minister who is trying to keep the peace, trying to keep things civil, knowing wholeheartedly that he is at war, possibly the worst war anyone in his you know, lifetime is ever going to see, uh, possibly ever. Yeah. Uh, in the history of the wizarding world. So he, this man's doing what he can. He's trying to make simple steps that would benefit the people. Yeah. Uh, so in my opinion, I see nothing wrong with what Rufus is doing. I think Harry blows this out of proportion out of the water. Uh, but this does establish the fact that he is Dumbledore's man. He's his right-hand man. He will stick by Dumbledore uh, through and through. But it's stupid and short-sighted. If you're, right, if you're the right-hand man to Dumbledore... And you show up at the uh, Ministry of Magic every week. Mightn't you be able to talk someone into Dumbledoredom? Okay. Mightn't you be able to talk someone into a point of view that is not popular at the Ministry? Possibly so. Uh, now, I can't see Harry's apprehension when it's mentioned that Dolores Umbridge was the one who said, Hey, Harry wants to be an Auror. Uh, there's a little bit of bad blood between the two, obviously, and warranted bad blood. Uh, but she's still the one who said, Hey, this is what this kid wants to do. Yeah. Why don't we give him a shot? Well, that could be... Obviously, what she could be doing is trying to, to use the situation to her advantage. Okay. But the best way to combat that is to absolutely use the situation to your advantage. Right? So this is not... And to put it in the correct nomenclature, this is not a situation. This is an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. This is an opportunity that is shot down. You Always should... take opportunities. I agree. Always take opportunities. And if you screw them up, you lost an opportunity. If you get anything out of it, you took an opportunity and got something out of it. Even if it's your B plan. Even if it is something that is meant to deter you, to detract from you. Um, you, you take that opportunity and you spin it the okay. best you can. And if you don't spin it, well then you have, you have experience not spinning it. What could you do differently the next time? Fair enough. Uh, there has been the theme of a little bit of like anti-government throughout these books here. You know, the ministry can't be trusted. They make countless mistakes that are very simple mistakes. Uh, so th that is interesting to continue to paint that light and to have your protagonist, you know, basically uh, spitting in the face of the government. Yeah. Uh, going rogue and saying, you know, I'm supporting Dumbledore. I, I trust in him. What we do is between us. Uh, it, that is what's best. And Harold what Rogue go. Poitier. The Rogue Wizard. Uh, so we do have that going on. Uh, some good points brought up there. Uh, let's continue to talk about this Christmas party here. We do have the mention multiple times of who is the Half-Blood Prince. Uh, he sits down and talks with, I believe it's Remus Lupin, uh, saying, you know, hey, is this you? Was this my dad? Is this anybody you know from your time in Hogwarts? Uh, and Lupin wholeheartedly says, no, Harry, there's no such thing as princes in the wizarding world. There's never been a prince. Uh, this is nothing. <clears throat> that spell that you use, the Levi Corpus or whatever, 
Uh, it's just a popular fad. It was a thing when I was a kid, and you know they come and go. That was interesting to see. That was interesting to read about. Okay. So it's like um, like those slap wrist bracelets. Okay. Those were big when I was five, and they were big last summer or whatever. You know. Okay, well, things come so back. That's things how come. Fads yeah. Work. So it's interesting to hear the magic talked about in that way. But the one thing that I'm really starting to draw <clears throat> from this, which unfortunately is a book from the end, I don't think this series ever really gave itself the opportunity to be inclusive. Okay. And one of the reasons for that is that every single one of these books revolves, hinges upon Christmas. Okay. At the middle, we have that Christmas break. Why Christmas? Well, I mean, if we're looking at this book as like a, a school year, uh, Christmas is the mid. Christmas is the break. That's the change in pace where you go away, you have your Christmas break, and you come back, and things are always different. Right. But why Christmas? Why Christmas specifically? We have all of these other holidays in the magic world that we've talked about. We have okay. all of these other historical events in the magic world we've talked about. If you were writing a series for children that is to be inclusive that is to teach kids that their way is not the only way, right? <clears throat> One of the major things with which that could be expressed is if their winter holiday was not Christmas, but d diddly dormus, right? Diddly dormus? Diddly dormus. Festivus or, break? Yeah, some type of, of festivus or solstice or something like that. Because <clears throat> I remember being from the Midwest... You know, Midwest United States, old Kansas City, Missouri. I, I was, I, I don't know when this happened, but it was a long time before I realized, you know, the whole world doesn't celebrate Christmas. That's fair. That's right? fair. So one of the ways that you break this illusion of one culture to rule all is that you just, you put out there that, hey, you know, not everybody's doing this right now. Interesting. So the fact that all of these books hinge right in the middle. Hinge upon Christmas is it, it, the the series never had the chance to really promote diversity or inclusiveness or um, promote the awareness in children that quite honestly they they so heavily proclaim that they do. Okay. A uh, complete side note here. I do agree with you that like growing up in the Midwest, I mean Christmas that that's the holiday, man. That's it. You don't go anywhere on Christmas because literally everything is shut down. You can't get gas. You can't go to the grocery store. Uh, I moved to St. Joseph from a very small town in Missouri, and there was a little convenience store not far from my grandmother's house that was run and owned by a Jewish man. Therefore, it was open on Christmas. And, like, it got to the point, like, I would go there and just buy shit I didn't need because I'm like, on Christmas? Yes! I'll buy all of this! I can do things? Uh, so it, it is a different world, and there was an opportunity there to make this a very different world, especially when we're looking at the wizarding world uh, that was not capitalized on. And what, what, when you are, this is children's literature, 100% wholeheartedly. Yeah. So there's a lot of kids who get this read to them as opposed to reading this, correct? I would assume, yes. What that's going to prompt is you're going to prompt an entire lesson from that. Okay. Because mom or dad, whoever's reading this, is going to say... You know, honey, this is a lot like Christmas break. But it's not Christmas break, Mom. No, not everyone has Christmas break, right? Okay. So it's, it, it forces the opportunity to discuss that. I, I do think there is some interesting discussion that could be made as well, saying that the Wizarding World is celebrating a Christmas. They're celebrating a Christmas break. Uh, what kind of religion does this Wizarding World follow? Obviously Christianity. So is the, even if we can all do magic and we can all you know do this and we can live forever, we still follow this Christian faith. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Uh, so that there is some interesting arguments that could be made there. We should look more into that. I think that would be a gorgeous rant series, honestly. What titled what? I, I have no idea. Christianity and the Potter Happy World. Christmas. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we do have that going on. Harry uh, Christmas. Have a Harry Christmas. Uh, I, I hate to do this, but we have to. I think we have to talk about potions again. I don't want to do it. We have to. 
I don't want because to. Because you got a little, you got a little flack here for talking about potions. And really? Like, you did get a little flack. What was it? What was it? I, Tell there, me. There were some disagreements that you know the. Although this love potion was given to someone, it, it's just a love potion that wouldn't be considered rape. Uh, so, I sub, I su look. I suppose technically, I can I can warrant those arguments some credit because it's not technically rape. It's so much worse than that. Okay. It is an entire. It's it's more akin to. An entirely abusive relationship, is it not? In which rape is institutionalized, if you want to look at it that way. Okay. <clears throat> in uh, those abusive relationships, sex is a tool, and it is exploited by the aggressor and or the, the dominant member, right? Okay. That is, is that, tell me that, tell me I'm wrong. I mean, tell me, explain to me that I'm wrong. It's. You were you were convincing someone they are in love with you, despite the fact that they, in the in the in the case of Tom Riddle and Merope, he didn't even really seem to know who she was. Okay, didn't even really seem to know who she was. That is, that is the same thing as a uh, guy in the Affliction T-shirt and a backwards cap. Meets drunk girl at the bar, takes her back that night, and all of a sudden he runs her life. No, yeah. strip cover lit, sponsored by Affliction T-shirts. I guess <laughs> a good, good. We're, uh, we're making progress. Good merchandising we're drop them up. there. Uh, but we we do have to talk about it because at the beginning of chapter fifteen, the Unbreakable Vow. That is what we're talking about. Uh, well, Hermione, I'm starting to I'm starting to get suspicious that uh, little Ginny, little Ginny Weasel. At some point, has just walked around the school spraying people with a love potion. Yeah, because that's that's how suddenly this Harry Potter infatuation comes about. Okay. Uh, well, Hermione warns Harry that the women in the Gryffindor Hall are basically plotting. Are rapacious. Uh, uh, they're going to slip him a love potion. There are multiple women who they're going to get to him first. Uh, this progresses so much so that a woman does approach Harry and say, "Hey, would you like a drink of this here?" He's like, "No, I'm good." He's like, "Oh, well." Take these chocolates. Just have them, Harry. Just keep them for yourself. Yeah. Uh, so, a little scandalous. little uncomfortable. Um, yeah, I, I don't understand. And that's one of the things you always have to look at here with an argument like this. If we were to reverse the roles in this... Yeah, how easily would that be accepted as It would be rape. atrocious. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I'm going to stick by your argument on this. I'd love to hear other people's comments about this. Uh, but it is a little uncomfortable. And it's even in the text to be uncomfortable. But when you think about it a little bit more, it, it's... Well, but it's, it's not really uncomfortable in the text. What is it? Hermione never sticks up for Harry Potter. Okay. Hermione just says, you know, there's some girls in there taking a, taking a pee and talking about how they're going to drug you. And then she's off about her day. All right. She's like, I, you know, I just wanted to let you know. Just another day. Nothing yeah. big. Nothing yeah. big. And then... Um, there's something else. Go on. Okay. Because I forgot it. Oh, well, let's talk a little bit about the uh, slug porn party here. The what? The slug horn party here. <laughs> that is not what you said. I know. It's a lot, slug, lot of... Slug porn hardy. Slug, slug porn hardy. That's... Hashtag slug porn hardy. Slug horns party here. Uh, we do get a scene between uh, Snape and Draco. <laughs> yeah. I can't talk this morning. Um, where uh, we kind of move on with the Unbreakable Vow here. We know that Snape is there to protect Draco, and we find out later that the Unbreakable Vow, when broken, means you're going to die. It will kill you if you break this vow. Yeah, uh, so, so that's what's going to happen. Okay, so Snape is now, uh, by death, uh, bound to protect Draco. Yeah. Do we have any idea what Draco's mission is yet? Any thoughts? Well, it's probably to kill Potter. Okay. Or to uh, deliver Potter. Okay. One of those things I have to imagine. This, the only thing I think we've been given reason to assume. Okay. Um, perhaps I'm wrong on that. Uh, well, whatever it is, there is a, obviously some kind of grave matter because it is taking its toll on Draco. He seems a little more skittish. He seems thin. He's been working overnights. And he's been working <laughs> overnights. It's just bad news for him. Uh, but we do get that, and we find out more so that Draco has been taking personal lessons by Bellatrix Lestrange. Uh, so it seems now that Draco has moved on as they're becoming budding adults in the Wizarding World. Uh, he has given his allegiance to Voldemort. I, I don't assume, I don't think you could assume he would be doing anything else at this point. Right. 
Um, so did we ever establish what the what was a variety hour you talked about um, drinking in in Europe? I've had a few people respond on this. Was that like, variety hour though? I no, I believe it was Harry Potter, for sure. Was it for sure Harry Potter? Uh, okay. And like a lot of people have said, yeah, that's absolutely not a thing. You can't be intoxicated. Oh no, in that's not, I'm, I'm sorry. I I brought that up ham fistedly. What my goal with the question was is what is adulthood in the UK? I I believe there was one comment saying that like at 16, I mean with like a parent around, you can have a beer in a restaurant. It's, in the UK or in I some believe Europe? the UK. Okay. Um, and that's considered like a, a light alcohol. It's not a hard spirit. Because uh, we we see Harry Potter with mead here. Harry Potter has mead, and not this. just not just butter b- beer. At one point, somebody offers him a drink of fire water. I think is what they actually call it. Yeah, or fire whiskey. But I'm I'm pretty sure they said fire water. I don't remember. Uh, so I mean, we do get some drinking going on here. And if if it is sixteen, they're sixteen here, right? Yes. So Draco is an adult. Uh, at 17 in the Wizarding World, you're considered an adult. Oh, that's right. We've, yeah. Yes. That's already uh, but at 16, I, this is something. Uh, and, and from my understanding, like in an educational setting, absolutely not. However, I would assume that we are away at boarding school. You're no longer in an educational setting. You're at this private party with professors, with adults. Uh, at 16, I, it would be reasonable that you could have a beer, have a glass of mead, uh, partake in the lighter alcohols. Uh, but we do see some drinking going on here. Uh, these kids are now progressing to the fact that they're going to be adults next year, uh, legal adults in the wizarding world, and they're just they're hinging on that right about now. Right. So we're going to get some interesting dynamics, some uh, darker themes for sure coming up later in this book here. That um, does set up. Um, in, so, in the United States, you're an adult at 18. Yes. Happens sometime during, shortly before, or shortly after your senior year in high school. Yes. Sets up a strange dynamic at times in high school, doesn't it? It does. Because you always have certain kids. I don't know about where you went to high school, but I, the high school I went to, we had a pretty high dropout rate. You always had kids that were a danger for just leaving, just getting up and going. Okay. In this world, that would set up, well, in, in, and in the UK, which is just a strange and awkward world as well, I imagine. Um, I wonder that, that dynamic. Okay. You're talking about sophomores and juniors who are legal adults. Um, and this is, this is not necessarily a Harry Potter thing, but it is interesting as someone who does not come from that culture to think about that. What well, is that dynamic? Let's look at the twins, Fred and George. Uh, they basically absconded from school and became entrepreneurs. Yeah. They left and like So this is a thing. It is happening, obviously. Once you're an adult, you can make that decision on your own. Um, much like, I would assume, the American education system, though, you become an adult at 17, which would be your last year. Yeah. So if you would like to make that decision, I mean, albeit, that's on you. Uh, so I, I, we will get a little bit more about that. Uh, for sure, the next book, there are some different things going on here, so I think we'll answer some questions going forward, which is great. Uh, anything else you want to touch on here on I've, Harry Potter? I've got one small note on sexism in the text. Okay. For anyone who's stuck around this long. Ron is noted. I don't. I think it's by. I think it's by Harry even, as being quote unquote aggressive. Yeah, it was when. So, Ron's been snogging. Yes, and he's a lot lighter going. Which, by the way, fuck you, J.K. Um, but since he's been doing that, he is noted by Harry as being less aggressive. Okay. We never get it noted that Hermione... Now, what is aggressive? Aggressive is a stereotypical masculine trait. What an aggressive man. What a mean man. Okay. We are never told that Hermione is being incredibly emotional. Or Ginny, when she has her outbreak, she's being incredibly emotional. Okay. Right? This is the opposite side of that coin. This is the obverse of the aggressive coin. In femininity, the stereotype is uh, emotional, emotionality, right? Okay. So we get it that people, and what's the big, would have been goalie's name, McTaggan, McTaggart, Mc... Mc something. Mc something. He's noted as being aggressive. What about these hysterical females? McLagan. McLagan. 
What, be, what about these hysterical girls? Fine choice of word there. Uh, never really mentioned. Yeah. Okay. So, JK doing a little bit of attacking the masculine side. Well, I mean, and in, 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 in what it is, is that all of these masculine texts, texts that have been written by men, are seen as being sexist because what does in Hills Like White Elephants, Ernest Hemingway doesn't call, um, what was her name in that, the Ooh, woman's name? Jig? Jig. Does not call Jig emotional he just shows it okay but that's sexist because she's so emotional in that piece what a sexist piece here we have people actually being labeled as gender stereotypes okay being not aggressive sex- sexist right interesting so, but what it is is like it's interesting like i don't i don't care about any of this i don't care about it but i'm gonna harp on it because um it comes from the opposite direction, right? Okay. J.K. Rowling is always talking about these things, these tropes, these uh, call this writer out, doesn't write diversely, things like that. But what's interesting to me as a writer and as someone who considers themselves a bit of a critic, that's why we do this channel, those are the observations that manifest themselves from an author's viewpoint which they of which they are not privy right okay. so it's just the same as a text in which a black character is is noted as being black okay but none of the other characters races are noted why is that is written from a white viewpoint you don't notice when someone else is white but you notice if someone else is black Okay. That, so that's, it's the same thing there. And that's what makes that text racist. Because of the assumptions of the writer. So it is interesting to see those things pop up whenever they pop up. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that it is something by which we must judge the author. I don't think that it is necessarily something through which we must cast shade upon the text. But it is interesting to make the note, right? Uh, I think it's a Derrida idea that everything you say, you also imply the opposite, right? So, like, when you note someone, if if a character is introduced in your text and you say, that was a woman, well, then it's assumed that everyone else is a man. All right. Right? So it's just interesting to see those little assumptions at play, and it's always it is always helpful from a critical standpoint to notice those things. And um, like I say, you don't necessarily have to judge the text or the author by it, but it is interesting to note and observe. All right. Well, we will have to keep an eye for that in the future, but we will certainly be back next week with more Adrian Reed's Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, chapter 17, chapter 18, two chapters at a time through the rest of the books here. And if you like this kind of thing, make sure you hit the the subscribe button down below. We do Adrian Reads Harry Potter every single week on Wednesdays. And we do plenty of other content as well. I will excuse you from next week's class if you promise to burn your book. Leave a comment in the comments section down below. I exclusively read the comments. I keep Adrian in the dark. So if there's anything you'd like to discuss or you'd like me to discuss, make sure you bring it up. And if you'd like to help us continue to make quality content here on the booktube, there is a link to our patronage in the description below. God damn it. Okay. And fear always lingers. Yeah. Good thing we're pros. Yeah. <clears throat> Good? Yeah.